Just sitting on the wire, watching cars go by. I say, are you trapped, bird? He says, as trapped as I'll be, but what's the use in flying? If all you do is follow who's in front of you, and you end up right where we are. See, we are far from perfect, wondering, is it worth it to flap our wings and try too hard? something missing where well, the blackbird says it's something in the air and while it's coming well me and this blackbird we're waiting for this something to come on by by we're waiting for the chance of a life time to find the meaning of what it means just to fly high Cause even if we fall, we should flap our wings, yeah, flap our wings and try too hard. Well, there's a blackout, I know it's on the way and I know so I won't be surprised. Well, and the blackbird shouts, sure as trapped as me Cause I don't want to use my eyes If all they need to see is in front of me This world and all its scars So we are far from perfect Wondering is it worth it To flap our wings and try Just a little too hard a black cloud we're headed this way but who's to say that's a bad thing and while it's pouring well me and this blackbird we're waiting for this storm or to pass us by by we're waiting for the chance of a life time to find the meaning of what it means just to fly high Cause even if we fall, well, I'm gonna flap my wings. Yeah, flap my wings and try. See, I am that blackbird just sitting on the wire, and I'm watching my life go by. My dreams are fractured, and I did it myself. I'm too afraid to put myself on the line, but now I get it. We're just in time. With time to turn around and look this world in the eye And say, know thyself and own thy mind I leave my wire and I say, I say goodbye, bye See, I was waiting for the chance of a lifetime But found the meaning of what it means Just to live my life Cause even if we fall, we're gonna flap our wings, yeah, flap our wings and try too hard. Good morning and welcome to First Christian Church of Burbank, a place of God's hospitality and love. No matter who you are, no matter what brings you to the service this morning, know that we believe you are welcome here and held in God's love. A few words about our service together before we move deeper into worship. You will notice two tables, one in the back of the sanctuary and one in the front with candles. If that's a meaningful way for you to offer prayers or reflection, you're certainly more than welcome to light those candles during the times of singing, the times of prayer, or even after worship. Also, we will be breaking bread at communion later in the service, and there are multiple ways now to engage that part of the service. You are certainly more than welcome to come forward and to receive the bread and then to return to your seat with the cup. 
There are also all-in-one communion cups near the entryway. And we've also added this week gluten-free options for those who need that space in order to broaden our welcome. So those gluten-free all-in-one cups are labeled in the back, and there's also some up here if you find that necessary. But know that however you understand communion, whatever brings you to that time in our service, you are welcome in that space. Also, later in the service, we will be offering prayers. Prayers for those we know and love, and prayers for the circumstances of this world. And there are multiple ways to share those prayers. Green prayer cards near the entryway, Facebook Live for those who are joining us virtually, and then certainly to find one of the leaders, the elders, myself, or the staff after worship, and we'll make sure to include your prayers in our prayer life. But know that however you understand prayers, those prayers are welcome in this space. Nellie is meeting with our children in the children's ministry space. Misan is meeting with our youth in the youth room. If you want more information about any of those opportunities, let us know uh, after worship and we'll get you the relevant information. Also, we have folks joining us in person and on Facebook Live this morning, as we do every week. It's a wonderful way to engage. If you want to follow along in the sanctuary, you're more than welcome to do that. But we encourage you to interact with one another in those spaces. Make comments if you're online. Let us know where you're joining us from. It reminds us that we remain connected in this increasingly digital and virtual world. So with that spirit of welcome and God's presence, let us stand as we are able and join together in song. Faith can move the mountain. 
mountains let the mountains move we come with expectation waiting here for you waiting here for you you're the lord of all creation and still you know my heart the author of salvation Love me from the start Waiting here for you With our hands lifted high in praise And it's you we adore Singing And as we move deeper into this time and space of worship, we come to that time in which we offer prayers. As I said earlier, prayers for those we know and love dearly. Prayers for this world and for circumstances that are even beyond our own lives. As I said earlier in the service, there are multiple ways to share those prayers. But after I share a prayer from this congregation, I will then say, God, in your mercy, I invite you to respond with the simple phrase, hear our prayer. Before we enter that time of sharing prayers, I invite us to embark on a new exercise we started, and that's by simply breathing in God's gifts. And so I invite you to repeat or follow me. Let us begin this time of prayer by simply breathing in God's gift of peace. Let us breathe in. Let us continue by breathing in God's gift of hope. Breathe in. And finally, let us breathe in God's gift of love. Let us breathe in. And let us continue this time of prayer. I begin with a prayer of thanksgiving for all of you. Last week, I was off last Sunday because we, as a family, we dispersed my mother's ashes. And I was able to step away for that responsibility and then watch the service online and you all don't need me, which is absolutely remarkable and in a disciple's best tradition. So I give thanks for the leaders of this congregation and for Reverend Dr. Aaron Park, who stepped into this space to offer his words. So I give thanks for First Christian Church of Burbank. God, in your mercy. We also give thanks for the number of partners in ministry that help us to embody God's love in this community and beyond such as Home Again LA, Burbank Temporary Aid Center, Homemade Thursdays, Project Mercy, the Burbank Armenian Association, LA Voice, Green Chalice, Burbank Pride, Week of Compassion, and so many others. God, in your mercy. As temperatures rise around this area, we also continue to pray for those who are most vulnerable. 
who fall victim to those temperatures because of spaces that aren't safe or exposure to these elements. And also a reminder to keep in prayer all of God's good creation that strains under the effects of climate change. God, in your mercy. We also continue to pray for Nancy and Brian Hurst as Nancy continues her recovery at home. God, in your mercy. We pray for Janet Teal, who was recently hospitalized, is now in a recovery center in North Hollywood. May we continue to pray for Janet. God, in your mercy. And all of us, or most of us, are aware of the strikes that are going around, going on in this area. So we hold in prayer the writers and the actors and all those who are affected by inequalities around income in this area. And that stretches near and far in Hollywood, North Hollywood, Burbank, and beyond. Let us pray. God, in your mercy. We have a number of people in this congregation who are traveling this summer, so we hold those families in thought and prayer. God, in your mercy. We continue to keep the following people in prayer who are facing some kind of ongoing medical uncertainty. We pray for Janet, Pam J, Janine, Carlos, and Benet and Rashid. God, in your mercy. We also continue to pray for just and lasting peace for those communities who face violence and uncertainty on a daily basis, particularly for Armenia and for the Ukraine. God, in your mercy. We pray for those who are experiencing homelessness right now and for those who are seeking stable housing and those who seek to care and stand with them. God, in your mercy. We pray for those communities experiencing an increase in hateful rhetoric resulting from racism, homophobia, sexism, and other forms of violence. God, in your mercy. We continue to pray for those struggling with addiction in its many forms and those people who seek to love and care for them. God, in your mercy. Finally, we turn our attention back to this community of faith. May we continue to be a place of God's all-encompassing love, mercy, and grace. May we continue to offer reminders of hope, peace, and joy. God, in your mercy. Let us continue this time of prayer in song. Will you come and follow me if I will call your name? Go where you don't know and never be the same. Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Let my life be grown in you, and you in me. Will you leave yourself behind if I but call your name? Care for cruel and kind and never be the same will you risk the hostile stare should your life attract or scare let me answer prayer in you and you in me will you let the blinded see if i but call your name Set the prisoner free and never be the same. Will you kiss the leper clean and do such as this unseen? And admit to what I mean in you and you. hide if I but call your name will you quell the fear inside and never be the same will you use the faith you found to reshape the world around through 
through my sight and touch and sound in you and you and me Lord your summons echoes true and I call your name let me turn and follow you and never be the same in your company I'll go where your loving footsteps show and I'll move and live and grow in you and you and me yes I'll move and live and grow in you I invite you to join me in a time of prayer. God of deserted places and abundant love, we come this morning from a myriad of places, busy places, slow places, noisy places, colorful places. We simply ask that in the mystery of your presence, that regardless of where we come from, that you welcome us in surrounding us with that profound sense of love, peace, and a reminder that we just might be home. For you have heard our prayers this morning, prayers for the circumstances of this world that leave our hearts heavy, prayers wondering where we will turn next, but also prayers of thanksgiving for excitement, for joy, and for community that reminds us of your love. Regardless of those prayers, God, we ask that you again surround us with the mystery of your love and presence. And as we offer those prayers, regardless of where we are at, that you continue to empower us to be people of love, hope, and justice in this world. And as we emerge from this place to return to the places from which we come, may, may we carry reminders of this community and your mysterious presence. We offer all this in your sacred name, amen. Today's scripture is from Matthew 14, verses 13 through 21. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot to the towns, from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass, Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled, and they took up what was left over from the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about five thousand men besides women's and children. I invite you to join me in a time of prayer. Join me in a time of prayer. God of ancient story and numbers of places, open us this day to your presence, abundance, and love. In your name we pray, amen. A deserted place seems really nice right now. A deserted place seems really good right now. Not just for me, but a number of you, I think. Let me just step through the things I've heard from the past couple of weeks. Teenagers with their abundant and confusing schedules. Age, taking care of an aging parent. The number of volunteer activities that stress us out. The emails from policy organizations that plead for yet another donation to make a difference in what's going on in the world. A church that has so many activities that it fills our calendar and we're not sure where to put our time or our talent. 
teachers looking at their schedules wondering, can we have a few more weeks before it hits? Strikers that are talking to their families and friends about where to gather and where to grab their signs. Oh, a deserted place sounds really good right now. Who's with me? <laughs> and that's where our gospel story this morning begins. Before we get in the hustle and bustle of what transforms, we're given the indication that Jesus and his disciples are headed for a deserted place. And as biblical scholars would remind us, we need to put this story in context of where the writer of Matthew puts it. And then we begin to understand just why they might be headed for a deserted place. This story comes on the heels of the death of John the Baptist. After a myriad of healings and miracles that had taken place, teachings that had begun to pile up. So much like our own lives, it makes sense that Jesus and his disciples would say, ooh, a deserted place feels really good right now. But what begins to unfold is the revelation that deserted places, while might offer temp temporary refuge, they're not void of teaching and opportunities to glean truth, insight, and hope into our own lives. Because just as that moment in which they were trying to retreat to find a deserted place, indeed the, the gospel writer says that is a deserted place, we figure out that even in deserted places, there are an abundant opportunities to learn, to heal, and to even act. And so that's where I believe the message comes this morning. In our quest to find deserted places, we as people of faith are called to open up to the myriad of teachings that are offered in those spaces. Deserted places are anything but void or absent of life, hope, healing, and opportunities to learn. And so before we step into the deserted space that the writer of Matthew places us in, I invite us to head to, in our minds, Gary, Indiana. Gary, Indiana. A deserted place, some might say. But most often known as the birthplace of Michael Jackson. When you hear Gary, Indiana, that's probably the first thing you think of. No? Music Man. <laughs> oh, there we go. There's another one. Where, what else do you think of when you hear of Gary, Indiana? Be nice. There might be people, be people that were born and raised in Gary, Indiana. Steel Mills. Cornfields. Well, consistently on lists of deserted places in the United States, Gary, Indiana comes up because of City Methodist Church that is in downtown Gary, Indiana. And I encourage you to Google it if you have your smartphone or any device around. But as I say consistently, if you were to ask about deserted places in the United States, City Methodist Church would pop up not only on the top of the list, but probably a few places down. Built in 1926-ish, it's a result of that steel industry you mentioned. Gary, Indiana, for a moment in time, had become this opportunity of building wealth and vast amounts of industry. And there was a pastor, a Methodist pastor in Gary, Indiana, that sought to take advantage of that opportunity and dreamed of a Methodist church that would rival any Methodist churches in the Midwest. And during those 20s, what began to be constructed was a church that would rival any other church in the area. Nine stories tall built in a Gothic style. It was a reminder of ages past and what the church was capable of. 
City Methodist Church. But in 50 short years, their doors were closed. By the mid-1970s, City Methodist Church began to look like the rest of Gary, Indiana, falling victim to the societal structures that would cause people to flee the city. Economic abundance run amok when voids are created. Now, a number of theologians and sociologists will point to what was ultimately the downfall of City Methodist Church, but many will say white flight was at the core of that. A predominantly white congregation that was concentrating wealth and focusing it into a beautiful cathedral style church. As Gary, Indiana began to change, they left. As Gary, Indiana began to diversify, that church didn't adapt. And so what we now have is one of the United States' great deserted places. It still stands, but is rapidly falling apart. You can still enter, kind of, parts of it, and you can see a cathedral that once stood, nine stories that are no longer in use. And it's so terrifying that it's even used in movies now, Nightmare on Elm Street used that building. It is now a deserted place and has much to teach us about the shortcomings of Christianity in the United States, obsessed with wealth and not sensitive to diversity, obsessed with building tall buildings instead of staying attuned to community needs and insights. Yes, it's empty, and deserted, but it has much to teach us about Christianity, about wealth, about race, and about community. Deserted places sure sound nice right now, don't they? And so then we turn to the writer of the Gospel of Matthew and the deserted place that we are placed in the middle of this morning in that reading. And while those disciples and Jesus were looking for a place of refuge and healing, what they found themselves in was a deserted place that would teach them much about community resilience, about their capacity for good, and, for, and teach them about God's overwhelming sense of love and welcome. So let us learn from this deserted place. Fred Craddock, the well-known preacher and disciple, that if you're a lifelong disciple, you've heard his name probably countless times, reminds us that many times if you open your Bible and turn to this story, you'll see at the very top a title. You know those titles they include in the Bible? And it says, Jesus feeds the 5,000. And Fred Craddock will remind us that it shouldn't be titled that at all. It should be titled The Disciples feed the 5,000. The truth is this particular story is found in all four Gospels. And for those who are unaware of biblical scholarship, it's rare for a story to occur in all four Gospels in this manner. And that means this story becomes a central tenant and story to understand how community is formed, how theology is formed, and how we understand ourselves in this world. And so this deserted place begins by teaching us the power of empowerment and the significance of our capacity to do and be good in this world. And that starts with Fred Craddock's reminder of how this story should be titled. Did you hear that in this story? What happened? The disciples came to Jesus claiming their baskets were empty in this deserted place. And there were all these people that needed to be fed. And Jesus turned to them and said, you do it. You do it. 
Yes, Jesus offered a prayer and turned his head towards heaven, but ultimately in this story, he turns to those 12 and says, it is your responsibility and call to meet this crowd and to feed them yourselves. And what unfolds in this story is a lesson on human empowerment, that when we move into the communities that surround us and we are, in, are a part of, we can learn and listen to the needs of those we are living and working with. When those disciples moved in the midst of that crowd in a mysterious way, some of us might call it miraculous, they were able to meet those needs and to feed those individuals. It's a powerful reminder that at the essence of Jesus' ministry, was the capacity to teach and empower those around him. There are dangerous theologies out there that would encourage us to simply sit back and wait for God to fix the problems and social ills of this world. Pray enough and things will be made right. Go to enough church service, services and God will make your life good again. Believe the right ways, and God will act in this world. This teaches us something entirely different and invites us to claim a different theology. That we, as human beings and people of faith, are infused with the capacity and indeed empowered to be people of love, hope, and justice in this world, and simply hoping praying, and not that prayer is bad, but simply sitting back and hoping that somehow God will fix things is not the way in which Jesus acted, lived, and moved in this world. This deserted place in this gospel teaches us, teaches us that we as people of faith are empowered to be agents of love and justice in this world. Jesus teaches us, God empowers us. We have the tools to move among the marginalized, hungry, and desperate among us to make indeed the difference that is called for. And there are many other things embedded in this story and this deserted place that can teach us, but there's one other that I want to lift up that has reminders of a dangerous theological tradition in Christianity. And that's the phrase that is often used from Jesus and the gospel writers. One does not live by bread alone. And here's a little bit of historical scholarship. The Marcionites in early Christianity started to demonize and push away the very material things that cause sustenance in this world. That we don't need to be concerned about the material realities. If somebody needs housing, don't worry about it. If somebody needs food, somebody else will take care of it. For in the Marcionite tradition, what is really essential is the spiritual and metaphorical realities of this world. And we as people of faith are to push ourselves back from the material needs and realities of this world. But what this deserted place, the disciples and Jesus teach us, are the very physical and real hungers of this world matter to God and therefore matter to us. That when somebody's hungry, you find a way to feed them. When somebody's unhoused, you find a way to house them. When somebody is hurting, you found a way to bring, bring comfort and hope. When hate persists in this world, you find a way to build systems of love, affirmation, and acceptance. Sure, one cannot live by bread alone, but one needs bread to live. And so this deserted place can teach us a myriad of things. And so I remind you of just those two things this morning. That one, God empowers us consistently to be people of hope, love, and justice in this world. And two, the material needs and realities of this world deeply matter. 
We're not to shun them. We're not to silence them. But we're called to listen to them and to respond to them out of love, compassion, and hope. Yeah, a deserted place seems really nice right now. But be prepared for what it will teach you, for how it will restore you, for how it will heal you, for how it will empower you, for how it will remind you of God's love. There are deserted places all over this world for us to retreat to, whether it's in Gary, Indiana, whether it's in the Gospel of Matthew, whether it's here in LA, but if you find yourselves in those deserted places, just be prepared to learn something, to hear something, to be moved by something, and to realize that you have the capacity for good. You have the mark of God's love, and that is incredibly powerful and can make a difference in the world in which we exist. Yeah, a deserted place sounds really nice. Just be ready for what it will do to you. Amen. It's been uh, three years since I last served as an elder here at the communion table and led a meditation here. So that also means that you haven't heard a fishing story for that time <laughs> either. But that changes today. And it was fitting with the picture that Brandon had up earlier. <clears throat> as many of you know, I love to fish, fly fish in particular. And I also backpack a lot. Brandon and I have gone on several backpacking trips. I don't particularly like backpacking. Um, I don't like it at, at all, actually. I just backpack so that I can get away from the easy places that people find to fish. The farther away you go from people, generally the better the fishing is. So thus, I ended up at this place. Uh, this is Hilton Lake number nine found at 11,000 feet. It's in between um, Mammoth and Bishop, uh, above Tom's place on the Eastern Sierras. Anyway, my, my college buddies and I had hiked up there because there were supposed to be large, I mean, mean large golden trout in that lake right there. But after looking out over the water and not seeing any fish and then fishing for 15 minutes and changing flies and changing presentations, uh, I decided that the lake was fishless, that the amount of snow that had been up there had basically killed off the fish. Um, the place is beautiful, but deserted. It's even desolate. And I was a little upset because the intel I'd been given was wrong, and it took a lot of work to get there. But as we were walking out, and we were looking out, something in the water caught my eye. And it wasn't a fish. Kevin? Uh, hopefully this video will kick up. I don't know if it will. But in the bottom of the lake, right by the shore, was this caddis fly larva. Usually caddis fly larva are about the size of your this is a little entomology lesson, sorry, <laughs> about the size of your little pinky fingernail. But this one was about the length of my, in, uh, my pointer finger, a little less than that. I mean, it was massive. And as I looked at it, the, I started seeing these reflections in the water, more and more of them. I mean, I saw thousands and thousands of them. I'm going, how did I not see them before? I was looking for fish. 
not looking for the food source. And then I realized that there are going to be fish in this lake. If there are not fish in here underneath that ice that is still covering three-fourths of the lake, there are fish there because this is a massive food source. I've never, in all the Sierra Mountain lakes I've ever been to, I've never seen caddisflies, larvae that big. So I know I'll support a large, large golden trout population. I hope to go back to that lake sometime later on the summer and find out if there are actually fish in there. We'll see. I'll have to report back. The food on this table, though, is meager at a first glance. Just a simple wafer, a piece of bread, and a tiny cup, tiny cup of juice. But it is much more than it seems. This simple meal provides us with life beyond measure through Jesus Christ. Christ is the host of this table, and all are welcome here. After the words of institution that Chandra will lead us in, you are invited to come down the center aisle and partake of communion. They're all in one cups, gluten-free cups, uh, bread, and other options as well. Partake of the bread when you come forward and hold the cup and return to your seat. And after saying the Lord's Prayer, we will share the cup of life together. Come and look and experience the depths of God's love for each of us. This meal is understood in different ways and through different belief systems. You are welcome to participate regardless of what you believe about the bread, the cup, and God's presence. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is for you. Do in remembrance of me. And in a similar way, he took a cup, and after giving thanks, poured it out, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant given for you and for all. Each time you do this, do this in remembrance of me. In a few moments, you will be invited forward. If you feel comfortable, please take the bread and then return to the seat with the cup. Blake will lead us in the Lord's Prayer after everyone is served, and then we will take the cup together. But as Dave and Chandra have both reminded us, you are welcome at this table.
please join me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us take the cup together. Hello, everyone. Welcome in. Uh, so we have some announcements today. A uh, reminder that we do take uh, donations. If you would like to donate here in service, we have a donation basket at the back uh, where you can drop your donations. We also have the QR code, which will show up on the screen for those of us who are online. Uh, you can also mail in a check at any time or sign up on our website. And you can either donate one time or set up regular uh, deposits if you like to tithe and not think about it, which is my preferable way to do it when I actually have income. <laughs> every week we also have opportunities for study reflection and community engagement. Uh, nearly every Wednesday is our weekly study group. Readings are available through our midweek messenger, the weekly email. Uh, Thursday evenings is an opportunity to check in from people around the states. All of our online uh, viewers come and join us there. Uh, we can share stories and ask thoughtful questions and it's a great way to get connected with our greater community there. Uh, we also have Homemade Thursdays, a group that connects with those who are experiencing homelessness by provide, uh, providing a warm meal made by uh, resident chef Rashid, who is absolutely delightful. Uh, Moroccan food will change your life, just saying. Uh, they use our kitchen downstairs on Thursdays, and we're always looking for new volunteers. You can talk to Brandon for times on uh, orientation to get involved with that. We also have some monthly ministries that you can get involved in. Our Burbank Temporary Aid Center has a lunch packing the first Saturday of the month. Uh, the next one will be Saturday, August 5th. We also have our Queer Fellowship Club on the second Sunday of every month. If you're interested in that, you can come see me. I'm the one who runs that little shenanig uh, shenanigans. Uh, we also have a hiking club that explores the area on the third Saturday of every month. Although with weather being how it is, do check in with Brandon to verify that we're not canceling it due to heat because we want y'all to have fun and be safe. Uh, it's also time for the outcasts once again. We are playing our co-ed softball. If you are interested, you can always ask Brandon, who is one of our coaches, mm. even though he tries to worm out of it every time. You should probably or ask Dave. Dave. <laughs> Dave is also one of our head coaches. I just like putting him on the spot because it's fun. Uh, we, it is co-ed. We are always looking for female players uh, because we have lots of guys and trying to squee squirm in enough girls in there for us to play is always a struggle. So we encourage our sisters to come play with us. It's a lot of fun. You don't have to be good. Again, we are on the team. So trust me, we're there for a good time. I think we won two games last season, which is a record for us. Uh, we also would like to remind all youth and their families we are having a pool party at the Connolly's house July 23rd, 1230, which is this Saturday. Please make sure you are RS. Is it today? Today. Oh, Sunday. This is Saturday. That's wrong. So I should have read this earlier. Uh, please RSVP by talking to me, son, or talking to the Connolly's, I suppose. Did I miss anything, Brandon? Uh, yes, I'll jump in and do a couple of things. One, we have coffee and conversation after worship. Tiffany Crane and her daughter Mary Bell are hosting. So I encourage you to stick around for the, that good food. If you're interested in volunteering for uh, coffee and conversation, there's a sign-up sheet. And if you're new to the community and it scares you, uh, see somebody after worship and we'll uh, pair you up with somebody who, who can help you through that process. And don't be intimidated by some people who really do lavish things. If I'm ever in charge of it, it's a bag of fruit and a box of donuts. So um, it's a diversity of ways to do coffee and conversation. Uh, also, uh, considering the heat right now, last week we decided to start a collection of bottled water for homemade Thursdays. When they head out to distribute the meals, they're now giving out two to three times the amount of water they were giving out maybe even three weeks ago. So if you pick up a case of bottled water and want to drop it by the church, let us know. Bring it on Sunday or during the week, and it will be put to good use. 
And finally, all of that is in our weekly email. Uh, a number of you have started to sign up um, and haven't for a while, so know that that information is found there. And if you want to sign up for it and haven't, uh, find me after worship and I'll get you the link, the link or take down your email address. Now, with all that being said and all that's going on, let us stand and join together in song. Tossing pennies in a well Empty pockets all turned out Happy, shining, blessed are The ones who hunger When our poverty is plain I'll try and burn it in my brain Trace a line around your face To paint a picture So further up and further in We've nowhere else to go as we plant the seeds of toil and tears, its beauty we will sow. Oh, blessed are the ones, oh, blessed are the ones, oh, blessed are the hungry ones. Let's build a house with turned out doors. So we can share what love affords Pour ourselves out like a wine That we've been saving So when our well is running dry And when we raise our glasses high Happy shining are the faces of the thirsty So further up and further in We've nowhere else to go but you give us seeds of toil and tears, its beauty we will sow. Blessed are the ones, oh blessed are the ones, oh, blessed are the thirsty ones. So further up and further in, we've no place else to go. And when all we have is what we need, it's joy that we will sow. Oh, blessed are the ones, oh, blessed are the ones, oh, blessed are the hungry ones. Blessed are the ones, sorry, blessed are the ones, blessed are the hungry ones. Family of God, go out in the world in peace. Have courage, hold on to what is good, return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all persons, honor all creation, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the love of God, the light of Christ, and the power and communion of that Spirit be with each and every one of us. Let us go in peace. Amen.